This could be one of the most important messages that has happened in the history of religion, of spirituality, of truth. You want to know why? Because we've been handed down so many lives, so many times over the centuries, and it's intentional, and we will prove it in this video. We're going to be talking about the real New Testament. We're going to get into the background of how did we get all of these current English translations that we have today, and are they something that can be relied on? And what we're going to find out is that we've been misled over and over and over again, but here is the great news. Yahuwah said he's going to pour out his spirit in these last days. He said that he's going to increase knowledge. And what's happened with this knowledge being increased, all the lies, all the distortions, all the darkness that has suppressed the truth for all these centuries is being tore down right before our eyes. And it promote the truth. What we decided to do is say, let's go ahead and take responsibility. Can we, in fact, love Yahuwah with all of our mind, with all of our strength? right? With all of our might, with all of our soul, can we really love him that way? If we do, he's calling us to go seek him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and all of our strength. And he says, if we do that, if we seek him with all we've got, then he will be found. And so as we go back and we look at history, we can see over and over again, where the children of Yahuwah, of Yisrael, sign named Israel, they were handed over time and time again to the enemies. Why? Because of their disobedience. And so what's happened because of this rampant disobedience, Yahuwah has allowed the distortions to happen with all these different translations of scriptures. So what we're going to do right here today, we're going to absolutely reveal these truths to you. And a lot of these ways you probably never stop and thought, but if you really Stop and think about what you're about to be shown. I believe you're going to have no other choice to, but to go, I've got to do something about it. And that requires your support. Because we are on the front lines here to promote the truth. We've decided to stop translating the translation of the translation of the translations, grabbing all of these distorted texts. And we decided to launch the truth scripture project to where we can just take the words in its most original form that can be found. That's either original scriptures or the earliest found scriptures. We have to have a basis of belief. We believe that basis should be scripture, but it should be accurate scriptures that can be relied on. So if you go back and you study the idioms, that means the ways of life of those times when the scriptures were written, then you'll have a great understanding of how they need to be expressed i.e. translated. So let's go in right now. Here we go. So we start with the truth scriptures update. That's really the focus of this entire video is to show you how we progress in some major decisions we've made. A blockbuster announcement is coming in this video that we've made to get down to the real New Testament. There's a call. As a matter of fact, there's a cry out for a real translation. People are betting and staking and believing their entire eternal lives based on the words that are coming out of scripture. But what scripture? So you got to really go ahead and you've got to stop taking for it granted when someone hands you a book that you read, where did it come from? Now, the big question is the Greek New Testament, is it a hoax? We believe that the Great Greek New Testament hoax is here, it's alive, it's prevalent. All of these versions that you are seeing today in English translations, almost every one of them comes straight from the Greek New Testament writings that was handed down. Now, if you look at the King James, New King James, NIV, Living, Amplified, American Standard, on and on and on and on and on. There's a ton of them. And every one of those have come from the Greek translations, which we'll go into in a second and prove to you where they came from and prove to you that this is a hoax. It's crazy. So we're going to break it down. And that's why 
we want to really look at and ask some questions today. Was the New Testament originally written in Greek? That's the question you got to ask yourself. Because if you go talk to all the scholars, the theologians, these seminaries, there's so many colleges and seminaries that are teaching fervently that the original New Testament was derived from Greek. Now, I'm telling you, and we believe that's a lie. And now the knowledge is being poured out. That's going to be proven. So we say no. And it's easy to prove. No, it's not originally derived from Greek. No, we're putting a stamp on that. We want you to really understand how important that is and how important that you back this project ASAP because we got to stop the nonsense. We got to ask the questions like, what language did Yahusha and his disciples speak and write in? Look how basic that question is. If we just stop and we ask ourselves, what language did Yahusha and his disciples speak and write in? We're going to come to the Conclusion, ASAP, they spoke in what's called Aramite, a.k.a. Aramaic, and Abari, a.k.a. Hebrew. Now, how do we know this? We have accounts from historians. We have record, and we have common sense. You know, what was awesome is when Mel Gibson did the movie, The Passion of the Christ, he did it in Aramaic. Go watch the movie again. When you see that the movie was produced in Aramaic, they asked Mel Gibson, why did you create that movie in Aramaic? He said, because we went and researched and, and understood that when Yahusha walked on the earth, Aramaic was the predominant language. Why? Because they had been taken into captivity back in, in Babylon by the Babyl Babylonians. So the original language is Abari Hebrew. Then they got taken into captivity, and then they got suppressed into speaking primarily Aramaic, Aramaic. And so that was the dominant language of that time. So they talked in, they read Aramaic, they wrote Aramaic, and then from the scriptures that have been handed down, those scriptures in the Tanakh were written in Abari, in Hebrew. That's why you see us when we do the truth scriptures translation, we work from the Codex Leningrad. Why? Because that's the oldest complete Tanakh, sign name Old Testament in the world, and then we work forward. So just like they were doing, studying the Tanakh in Hebrew, Abari, guess what? That's what we've done in our translation. But when they were speaking, when they were writing, when they were recording, they were doing it in Aramaic. Now, why is this important? Why is this critical to you? This language issue of between Aramaic Aramaic, Abari, Hebrew, and Yuani, also known as Greek. Why is this important to you? Well, we'll tell you why it's important to you. Let's go in to the correct translation. This is taken from the truth scriptures, which we've had to work hard because most of you that have been following the project and if you haven't been, we started in Barashit Genesis and we were working our way forward. Then a lot of revelations started happening as we were pouring out truth. We got all this feedback from the community because we pump out a lot of content. And then we saw what was going on. So we stopped, took the time and went in and properly translated from the proper translate from the proper uh, material that's been handed down. And we went in and we grabbed, for example, Yahuhanan, John, chapter 18, verses 3 through 8. Let's read it in its correct translation. Yahuda Iskariu. That's also Judas Iscariot, for those of you that know that name, which almost everybody does. That was the betrayer. Okay. He led a company of soldiers and officers from the chief priest and the parashim, that's the Pharisees, and they came there with torches, lamps, and weapons. But Yahusha knew all that would happen to him so he went out and said to them, who are you looking for? They answered him saying, Yahusha of Nazareth. Yahusha then said to them, Aya, Asher, Aya. That's the Hebrew words. The Arab, 
meat, Aramaic words are ana, ana. And what does that mean? It means I am that I am, the living Alua. Now, Yahuda Aish Cheriut, who had betrayed him, was also standing with them. And when Yahusha said to them, Aya Asha Aya, meaning I am that I am, the living Alua, they fell backwards to the ground. It was so powerful. What he, Yahusha said to them, to them is exactly what he said to them when he was in that burning bush on Mount Sinai, Sinai, talking to Masha. When he said, when they asked who, when Masha said, who should I tell them that is sending me? And the first way that Yahuwah responded was Aya, Asha Aya. That's to establish his incredible power of always being, always existing, and being the living Alua before, now, and forever. So Yahusha said those exact words when they came to take him that night and arrest him. Verse seven, once more again, Yahusha asked them, who are you looking for? Now, why do we think Yah Yahusha said it again? He was establishing a point that would go down through eternity. And they said, Yahusha of Nazareth. Verse eight, Yahusha said to them again, I told you, Aya Asha Aya, meaning I am that I am the living Alua. And if you are seeking me, then allow these with me to go. He said, let them go, go ahead and take me. But they fell to the ground. He established who he was right there. But guess what? You will not see those words written out, those specific words, Aya Asha Aya. Or even fully written out, I am that I am, the living Alua, you won't see them written out in any Greek translations. Check this out. In Markumi, Mark 14, 61 through 65. But Yahusha remains silent. So now he's arrested. He's in the courtyard, right? The high priest, they've got him. They got all the guards, all these people around. Let's go back to 61. But Yahushua remained silent and gave them no answer. Then again, the high priest asked him, saying, are you the Mashiach, meaning the Messiah, the son of the blessed? You got to understand when they're asking him, these are people that know the scriptures. They just, that's what they do. They study them inside and out, the parish of the Pharisees, right? They study them intensely. So they know when they ask him right there in, in verse 61, are you the Mashiach? The Mashiach means savior. Are you the Messiah? They know that in Yeshayahu, right? Chapter 43, that Yahuwah told them, told Yeshayahu, I should say the prophet Isaiah, Yeshayahu, told him that there is no other savior but me. That's what Yahuwah told the prophet. So what's happening is the, the parashim, the Pharisees, are setting Yahusha up to bait him for him actually to say that he is the Savior, knowing that the only Savior that could be would be Yahuwah. If anybody else claimed to be the Savior, that would be blasphemy. Look what happens next. Then Yahusha said to him, Aya. Asher, Aya, said it to the high priest and the whole company of them, meaning that I am the living Alua. Then he said, and you will see the son of man who sits at the right hand of the power, and I will come on the clouds of the heavens. Then the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need now? Look, from his own mouth, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think now? Then all of them judged that he was guilty and they condemned him to receive death. And some of them started spitting in his face. Then they blindfolded his face and started beating him and shouting prophecy. And the guards started striking him on his cheeks in his face. Okay. This is the issue that all of us that love the truth and want eternal life for real. This is the deal. I want you to look at verse 64 here, right there in that second row. 
Look, from his own mouth, you have heard the blasphemy, exclamation point. They killed Yahusha, make no mistake about it, for committing what they say was blasphemy. If you ask people today, you ask a thousand people, why did they kill Yahusha? Why was the Savior killed? You go ask any people in any religion that believes in, quote, the Savior, whatever, all the different names they call him, say, why did they kill him? Hardly anybody can pinpoint and tell you exactly why they killed him. They say, oh, because he came, you know, to be the Savior of the world, da, 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 da. No, got to be specific here. In translation, in understanding, to get to the truth, we got to understand that there was one reason that they killed him for committing blasphemy. They knew that they could get him impaled, sign name crucified. They knew that they could get that done if he committed blasphemy in their eyes. How did they say that he committed blasphemy? Back up into verse 62. He said, Aya, Asher, Aya. He said the same words that Yahuwah said on Mount Sinai to Masha. So what they were saying here is he's claiming to be the most high because they know that Yahuwah is one and that there's only one savior and there's only one person that's allowed to say Aya Asher Aya and that's Yahuwah. That's, this is critical to understanding, but what happens? Why does this matter? Why does this matter? In Yahuhanan, John 18, 5, in the Greek Yuani version, so the version that almost every one of us grew up on, whether it be King James, New King James, NIV, right? American Standard, New uh, American Standard, Revive, all the different ones. Go grab one. It's going to say something like, they answered him saying, but they're not going to have this name in here. I'm giving the benefit of the doubt here by putting Yah Yahusha's real name in here, Yahusha of Nazareth. Yahusha then said to them, I am. So the way it's written in almost all Greek translations is they leave out, look at the bottom here, the Aya Asha Aya, or in Aramaic, Anna, Anna. They leave it out. And if you leave that out, it changes everything because it can be conversational. I can say, uh, hey, do you, are you looking for your clothes? Are you looking for your coat? And you can say, well, yeah, I am. It's conversational. But if you go, I am that I am, you see, you see the difference there? Are you looking for your coat? I am that I am. Who in the world is going to answer that way? Nobody. But conversationally, they knew in the slyness of translation by not putting the ayah asha ayah, the ana, ana there, they knew that they could get you distorted and the whole trick behind it with all the Greek translations, they want you to follow Jesus. And we know that. And we know that as a false pagan name. No doubt about it. We all know that. Well, what happens is, is people come into the truth because a lot of folks were raised up believing in a different name of the Messiah, which is an entirely different Messiah in itself. If you don't call on Yahuwah for salvation, because Yahusha means Yahuwah saves. Right, watch this. If you don't understand Aya Asha Aya and get the correct translation, you're going to end up tricking yourself, believing there's two saviors. Or you're going to go ahead and separate and say that Yahusha is the savior and now Yahuwah is not the savior. Now you make Yahuwah out to be a liar. Because he said, before me, there was no savior. After me, there will be no savior. Go read Yisha Yahu, chapter 43 you'll understand how important this is. So leaving out Aya Asha Aya changes everything in this case. And we can't afford that when it comes to eternal life. So the divinity, right? The set apartness of Yahusha is everything. This is no game. This is eternal life on the line. So his set apartness, his divinity is everything. Why? Because in Yahuhanan, John 8, 24, in the correct translation. So this is now taken 
from the true scriptures. We're, we're properly, and we're going to prove that we're translating this properly. Guaranteed. I said to you, this is Yahusha talking. I said to you that you shall die in your sins. For unless you believe that Aya Asha Aya, meaning I am the living Alu, I am that I am, unless you believe that, you shall die in your sins. You see how crucial this is now? Believing that Yahusha is Yahuwah and Yahuwah is Yahusha, believing that when they say that we are one, believing that has eternal consequences to it. When you got the correct translation. So if you want to roll the dice and bet your eternal life on the fact that the Greek translation has led you in the right way, then guess what? I'm going to pray that you have a change of mind because I want to see you in eternity. That's how convicted I am personally. And I know many of us that Yahoo has shown the truth. We're completely convinced in what we're sharing with you. And that's why the translation is so important. But let's break it down. Let's tear down the stronghold. Let's tear down what might be holding you back from understanding the set apartness and divinity of Yahusha from understanding the true words. Now watch what I'm going to share with you. Now over here in this picture, this is an example of Greek translation in its minuscule version, by the way. Because we could even we could even say you can give a little bit of credence to the majuscule in Greek because they say Yahoo crew in the majuscule and in the minuscule they'll say Iesus leading to Jesus. But watch what happens here with these Greek manuscripts. There are almost 6,000 Greek New Testament transcripts. Did you know that? The number's close to 6,000. It's for sure over 5,800. 5, it's over that. So it's getting close, if it's not already there, to 6,000. Now watch and listen to what I'm about to say to you. The next bullet point. There's an estimated... 400,000 errors in the Greek New Testament manuscripts. Family, did y'all hear that? 400,000 errors. Now, I'm going to give a big, 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 big benefit of the doubt. Let's say that 90% of the errors are not significant. Let's just say, oh, they misspelled this word here or the, or the punctuation here. Let's just say 90% of that, which I believe is more. But that still leaves 10% that would be significant errors in this case. That would equal 40,000 errors in the scriptures you're basing your eternal life on. 40,000. Let's just say to reduce that number and let's just say 5% right, is what's significant. That would still leave 20,000 errors. Even at a 1% rate of being off the mark on the most significant matters, even if it was 1% off, that would still mean that the Greek manuscripts have about 4,000 errors. Now, how could you willingly and knowingly get this information and not go have questions going through your soul, through your entire being? And don't take my word for it. Go research this to see if it be true. I mean, we do research. We've been studying for over 30 years. That's why you can't move us easily. You can't shake us up. You can't intimidate us in the word because we've studied continually to show ourselves approved. And now, Yahuwah has called us to the front and said, put out a translation that doesn't have any of the nonsense in it, that doesn't have any of the influences in it, it has no way of being corrupted, has the inc incredible intention of Yahoo in it. Family, we got to do something about this because even at a 1% significant error margin, that means that what you're reading, you got 4,000 words, I should say errors, that could be messing up your eternal life. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because when you compare that to the Amer Aramaic and Hebrew, 
to the Amorite and the Abari, Aramaic and Hebrew. So you get to compare and decide. When you compare that to the Aramaic and Hebrew manuscripts, for example, in the Peshitta family, there's 360 transcripts. So this is in like Syriac, Syriac, Aramaic language. Family, listen to this. Virtually every one of the 360 transcripts are almost identical, extremely congruent. Aramaic Hebrew was the language that Yahushua HaMashiach and his disciples spoke. We, we, we established that earlier, right? So you see this, this picture over to the side. See, this is from the Peshitta, and that is Aramaic type writing, style writing. Historians, this is the most important part of what I'm going to share with you. And then I'm going to give you some opportunities to do something about it. Historians, even Greek historians, account that the Brit Hadash, sign name New Testament, was written in Aramaic or Hebrew. Now that, to me, is the greatest, or at least one of the greatest, Point, pointing points of evidence. To me, the greatest is what language did Yahushua speak when he was here? What language did his taught one speak? Did they, matter of fact, did they ever encourage speaking, writing, learning Greek? No. The parashim, the Pharisees, they would nail you down if you were studying and teaching Greek. They would look so down on you. They said they would rather eat pork, which we know, is not to be eaten than to learn and study and write in Greek. So we're going to do some historian background here. We're going to get what out of their words, quoting the, the historians that are Greek, that are like bishops from, and some of them as it progressed in the Catholic church was established some of from there. And I know they want to scrub this out of history, but it's too late. So watch. What do Greek historians, bishops, and theologians say? Let's look at it. Let's start with Papias. Papias, in 130 CE, he was a Greek bishop and historian. He wrote, Matthew composed his work in the Hebrew dialect, and each translated best they could. Hold on. Papias, in 130 CE, Right? So we know that Yahushua, when he died, somewhere around 30 or so CE, here is this historian and a bishop that's in Greek. He's saying, Matthew, Matit Yahu, the disciple, right? He said that the disciple, he composed his work in Hebrew. And after that fact, Everybody translated from there into Greek or whatever language the best they could. So that, just before we get to another historian, that proves right there that Greek could not be the original if you have someone that's needing to translate. That's the big question. If the Greek is the original, why did it ever have to be translated into Greek? See the common sense? We've been walking around as if we're like, the walking dead. How can we say that the Greek translation is the original if it had to be translated into Greek? Doesn't make any sense, does it? Arrhenius in 170 CE, second century Greek bishop fam. These are people that are Greek to the max and what they're saying, and they got a lot of weight back then. They were big time. He said, Matthew, Matit Yahu, the, the disciple, also issued a written gospel, Bashura, among the Hebrews in their own dialect. It only makes sense. Who's going to go? Are you around all the people? And the scripture says that the word was first brought to the Yahudim, sign named Jews, right? I'm talking about the real ones. I'm not talking about the parashim, those that are against Yahushua. I'm talking about the real people of Yahuwah. It was brought to the Yahudim as a whole, including the parashim, the Pharisees, first, then to the Gentiles. So the focal, focal message, initial big push, was on those 
who were of the Abari Hebrew nature, dialect, background. It only makes sense. He says it. Who else is saying it? Clement of Alexandria, 185 CE, Greek philosopher and theologian. In the work called Hypotoposis, so in Hypotoposis, to sum up the matter briefly, he has given us abridged accounts of all the, canon, the canonical scriptures. So from the canon, right? He's in all the canon scriptures. He's given an account. The epistle to the Hebrews, right? So the book of Abari of Hebrews, listen, there it is. He asserts was written by Shaul, Paul, to who? To the Hebrews in what language? In the Hebrew tongue, the Abari tongue. So that's one of the four books that was written actually in Abari in Hebrew. The rest were written in Aramaic. We have these Greek philosophers family, these historians, these theologians, these bishops telling us where it was originated from. Origin, scholar, theologian, historian, extremely off the charts respected. He says the first gospel is written according to Matit, Yahoo, Matthew, the same that was once a tax collector, but afterwards an emissary. Now look what he puts down of Yeshua, the Messiah. He knows the Savior's name ain't somebody called Jesus or Jesus back then. He knew it. Look, he wrote it. And guess what he said? Who haven't published it for his believers who wrote it in Hebrew, Abari. Come on, fam. This is so obvious. This is so obvious. Can't we see the great Greek hoax that's been perpetuated on us? Oh, now this is a big one here. This is a big one. Let me get, this is a big one. Let's talk about Eusebius. Why is Eusebius important? Well, he's a historian, a bishop. And look at this important note I put here. He was a close friend of Constantine who established Christianity, 325 AD. You remember that Council of Nicaea? Well, here's Eusebius, a close friend of the Emperor Constantine. Okay, let's see what he wrote. He wrote, Matit Yahu, Matthew, also having first proclaimed the gospel in what? Hebrew. Went on the point of going also to other nations, committed it to writing in his native tongue and thus supplied the want of his presence to them by his writings. So he says that even when Matit Yahu went to other nations, he still committed his writing to the native tongue of Abari and Aramite. You see, why was he doing? He said, I'm keeping this authentic. If y'all want to translate it, that's up to you all. It had to be what Matit Yahu was saying. And Eusebius is confirming it. Let's keep reading. Pantanus penetrated as far as India, where it is reported that he found the gospel according to Matthew, Matit Yahu, which had been delivered before his arrival by some who had the knowledge of the Messiah, to whom Bartholomew, that's Nathaniel Bartholomew, one of the uh, emissaries, one of the apostles, Bartholomew, as it is said, had proclaimed and left them the writing of Matit Yahu Matthew in Hebrew letters. There you have it. So when they even went and looked for it over in where? It says that he went as far as India. So out of Jerusalem, all the way over to India, when Pantanes got there, he found that this writing of Matit Yahu had been left by one of the other apostles, emissaries, Bartholomew. And what did he say? It was in the Hebrew letters. Now watch, for as Paul, Shaul, had addressed the Hebrews in the language of his country, some say that the evangelist Luke, okay, that's another, Luca, apostle emissary, 
Others say that Clement translated the epistle. So it got translated, not from Greek. It got translated into Greek by certain people. The great Greek hoax, we're proving it right here. Epiphanes, historian and bishop of the Catholic Church, 370 CE. They, the Nazarene, Nazarenes, as followers of Yahushua, right? Yahushua of Nazareth. They, Nazarenes, having the gospel according to Matit Yahu, quite complete in Hebrew. For this gospel is certainly still preserved among them as it was first written in Hebrew letters. This is somebody from the Catholic Church. That means they're Iesus to the max, which end up becoming Jesus. They're to the max on Iesus. But see, early on, these guys are trying to establish that they know what's up. You can see them flexing, going, hey, you know, we, we know the real deal. But guess what? They got That got hushed over the centuries. Like, shh. And all of a sudden, this Greek hoax came to the forefront. But all the people, even the originals from the Catholic Church, they knew. This was written in Hebrew, in a bar. So why has that been suppressed? Why? Jerome knocked it out of the park. Jerome in 382 CE, bishop and historian. Matthew, who was a Levi, a Louis, right? That's one of the, that's one of the 12 tribes. So he's saying Matthew is from the tribe of Louis, which is Levi in, in, in a sign name, and from a tax collector came to be an emissary first, a disciple, apostle, of all evangelists composed a gospel of Messiah in Judea in the Hebrew language and letters. Bam, there it is. For the benefit of those of the circumcision who had believed. See, it went first to the Yahudim, to the, quote, Jews. That's the circumcision, what he's saying there, who had believed, who translated it into Greek is not sufficiently ascertained. He says, I can't figure out who exactly did the translation into Greek. Look what he's saying. We got to pay attention to what is being said, family, right? So we know, again, he's going, somebody translated into Greek, not vice versa. Furthermore, the Hebrew itself is preserved to this day in the library at Caesarea. So now he's saying, I can tell you where it's at, which the martyr Pamphilus so diligently collected. So there was a martyr named Pamphilus that was collecting these writings. And he, guess what he says? Jerome says, I also was allowed by the Nazarene, the Nazarene, who used this volume, listen, in the Syrian city of Berea to copy it. There we have a crazy, cr crazy amount of proof of evidence. Who was known for their studies of the scriptures? We hear it all the time growing up, the Bereans, right? There it is. He's saying in Berea, in what? That's the Syrian city. That's where the Aramaic, remember I said the Syrian Aramaic transcript, the Peshitta, there he's pointing to it right here. He's saying he, those letters over in the Syrian city of Berea to copy it, in which it is remarked that wherever the evangelist makes use of the testimonies of the Old Testament, y'all got to listen to this next part, he does not follow the authority of the 70 translators, aka the Septuagint, but that of the Hebrew, Abari, he says he's not going to follow the Septuagint. Where does Septuagint thing come from? That Greek. He don't follow the Greek. Do you want to follow something that you now are hearing that is blatantly misleading? I don't think so. The Greek Septuagint. Where did this thing come from? I'm labeling, I'm going to label it and be bold here. See if you're going to be bold with me. I'm going to call it lies. I'm going to call it lies. Because I've seen what it turned into. That's why I can confidently call it lies. Who started this thing about the Septuagint? Where did it come from, the Greek Septuagint? Oh, Tolome the second, Philadelphus. Philadelphus, a Greek king of Egypt. People say, now how do you have a Greek king of Egypt? That's because Alexander the Great conquered Egypt. 
So from Greece, Alexander the Great from Greece conquered Egypt and now is passing on down. Now you've got Ptolemy II, a Greek king of Egypt in the third century. He desired a Greek translation of the Hebrew Torah, Torah for the famous library of Alexandria, the city of Alexandria. There we have it. Now we know where this Greek nonsense started from. There we got it. We know where the Greek nonsense started from. It's Ptolemy the second. He was a king. And if what a king wants, a king gets, right? So he desired to get his own translation. What he did was he put together 72, actually. They call it 70. That's what Septuagint means, Septa, seven. He put together 72 writers or historians and said, translate this into Greek where I can understand it. Translate what? Translate the Abari into Greek. I want you to translate the Hebrew, the Syriac, and the Aramaic. I want you to translate that into Greek, not the other. Why didn't he send them out and say, go translate the Greek into Abari? Why do, I want to know the original language that the, that the Savior was speaking. I need somebody to go translate it into that because all I've got is Greek. He didn't say that. He didn't say all I have is you, I need, which is Greek. He didn't say that. He said, I want you to go find me a way to get this translated from the Hebrew. There you have it. Then we progress all the way to 1516. So now I'm jumping ahead all these years. It's a mess what happened from his time. Go back. It's a mess from what happened at this time all the way to 1516, the Texas Receptus. This is another, what I call, book of lies. Where did this come from? Erasmus. This guy here is a picture of Erasmus I've got here on the screen. The Texas Receptus was published by Desiderius Erasmus. Everybody calls him Erasmus. Erasmus is... Didn't need to put an extra S there, but we keep moving. Erasmus's first edition was published in 1516, and he went on to produce several more editions. They were based on a small number of Byzantine manuscripts, but Erasmus had to rely on the Latin Vulgate. Now we're going to get another language involved for a few verses of the book of Revelation where he found the Greek manuscripts to be what? Incomplete. So the guy who did the big push on the Greek manuscripts is Erasmus. This is the big push. This is Christianity exploding now. From all this stuff, you hear about all this stuff with Christianity? Y'all can thank Erasmus for it because he perpetuated the great hoax at an all-time high. And he's admitting, I didn't have a whole completeness in uh, Greek. I had to go grab from the Latin Vulgate, had to go mix it up. So I, and I, remember, 400,000 errors. Even at 1%, you're still dealing with 4,000 errors. And you got all these people trying to translate. So the Texas Receptus is now getting translated from the Greek over into the English. There you go. From the Greek over into the English based on the Greek nonsense nonsense then after he made his big push you got the majority text philosophy that came up now you have these other texts that were popping up from greek see all this greek writing they're popping up all over the place remember six thousand of these things out there more lies now we got the majority text and this is what you're going to hear pastors uh Theologians, scholars, theology schools, they're going to be leaning on the majority text. Oh, we can't go with the minority text. Can't go with those few select that all agree with each other. No, 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 no. We got to go with the majority text. Well, let's watch the nonsense. The majority text nonsense. The majority text, also known as the ecclesiastical or Byzantine text, compiles Greek New Testament manuscripts Here's how they do it, by favoring the reading present in the majority of them. So they're saying the majority of them, if they all are kind of lined up, we're going to favor them, all right? So if 100 manuscripts have one reading and 200 have another reading, 
Well, then the 200 is selected. The latter is selected. Why? While this majority rules method seems like straightforward initially, it's crucial to consider these other aspects. For instance, let's say you go with the majority text uh, viewpoint and method, which I call nonsense. So for instance, if a Greek manuscript with errors is replicated a thousand times, those mistakes would outnumber a more accurate version replicated less frequently. So you see, if you got 200 manuscripts and they all agree with each other, but they all got the big mistakes in them, but they go, oh, these are all written the same, but they can all be written in all mistakes. They're going to say, all right, we're going to use that instead of the 100 that could be accurate. Nonsense. Can you say that with me? That's just nonsense. We want accurate. And why are we playing with this Greek stuff? Why? Now, when we take that compared to the Aramaic and the Hebrew, it's like shocking. Let's take the Peshitta, for example, for its consistency. Why do we want to guess and hope and wish on the, the Greek that's proven to have all these thousands of errors when we can get historical data like this? Check this out. The Peshitta an ancient version of the scriptures, i.e. Bible, in Aramaic, is renowned for the remarkable consistency across its 360 manuscripts. Pay attention to this. This consistency is especially astounding given the widespread geographical regions these texts have been found in and the vast time span over which they were produced. What does that mean right there? That's important to stop and capture that. What does that mean? It's saying that these scriptures were found in different countries, different regions, and they were found over a long different period of, of periods of time. I think it can mark as long as 1,500 years apart. And when they go pull them all together, that they, they, they were finding them in different places, all 360 are virtually identical. See, that's the greater weight of the evidence right there. The uniformity of the Peshitta manuscript stands as a testament to the meticulous care taken by these scribes and the stringent standards they adhered to when copying these set-apart texts. Such remarkable uniformity provide scholars and readers with a high degree of confidence. See, I'm a scholar. So when I read stuff like that, and when I go study stuff like that, and then I go actually go start doing the translations, I get a high degree of confidence. You should too, regarding the preservation and transmission of the Peshitta's content. This level of coherence contrast with the many other ancient textual traditions like Greek, whatnot, which often show a great degree of variance due to factors like scribal errors, errors, intentional edits, distortions, lies, right? Or regional variations. The Peshitta's consistency underscores its importance as a reliable witness to the ways of Yahuwah. That's important. That's critical. So what we got to look at here is the culture of Yahuwah, the ways of Yahuwah versus the Greek pagan culture. Culture says a lot about how things are going to get emanated, how they're going to be projected, how they're going to be translated. Huh? What's the culture of the Greek? What's the Greek culture like, fam? What is it? You already know. Hollywood is full of it. Greek pagan mighty ones, sign named gods. That's what it's filled with. I just went and put together a chart just to kind of refresh your memory because you know most of these. You've heard of most of these. And are they real? No. But are they worshipped? Yes. Are they honored? Yes. In which culture? Greek culture, which is now expanded all over the world. And more than likely, you've been influenced by it like I was early on until I snapped and came out of it. Look at Zeus, known as the what? King of the G-O-Ds, the gods. Oh, hey, Zeus. E-A-Zeus. Who's another Zeus? G-Zeus. 
Why do you think they wanted you to believe in Jesus? Because they want you to believe that Zeus is the king. So if I can get you to believe in a Greek translation, in a Greek culture, if I can get you to believe in that Greek culture, in that Greek translation, I can go ahead and whittle it down and get you to believe in a Greek G-O-D, mighty one, which is against Yahuwah's commandments. And you know it. You're going to put all your hope on Jesus knowing that it's out of the Greek culture and translations. That's where it came from. That's why they don't even want to deal with these quote, this is what's so amazing. This, this, these quote scholars just say, hey, let's deal with those minority Greek texts. Let's deal with the Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and Alexandrus. Let's deal with them. They're going to say, no, 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 no. You want to know why? I know why, because we've got one. When it says the name of the Savior in those texts, it says Yahoo Crew. There was no capital and lowercase letters. It's all capital, no spaces in the original Greek. But they won't even give that credence because they can't get away with getting you to believe in Jesus. Did I make that point? The king of the G.O.D.s, the sky, the sun, the weather, the order, the justice. Hera, queen of the G.O.D.s, marriage, women, childbirth, Poseidon. Y'all watching all these movies in Hollywood? The G.O.D. of the sea, seas, earthquakes, horses. That's their domain, they say. Athena, Athena, the goddess of wisdom and war, wisdom, strategy, arts, crafts, war. Ares, the god of war, war, bloodshed, violence. These are, this is the culture that everybody's trying to say that the Brit Hadash came out of. Come on. Apollo, God of the arts and prophecy, sun, light, prophecy, music, arts, mediums. What else? Artemis, the goddess of hunting, moon, hunting, wilderness, and animals, supposedly her domain. Oh, Aphrodite. Oh, yeah. All y'all out there that's all into Valentine's Day and all that stuff. Well, you're worshiping Aphrodite the goddess of love and beauty, love, beauty, desire, Hermes, the messenger of the G.O.D.s, the gods, the travelers, the merchants, communication boundaries, Demeter, the goddess of agriculture. Oh, that's who's really giving you your harvest, your grain, your fertility, huh? I think not. Dionysus. Dionysus, goddess of wine, god of wine and celebration, wine, pleasure, festivity, Theater. Oh, that's what you get your fun and, ha fun and happiness from. No, we don't. Hestia, goddess of the hearth, hearth, home, the domesticity, city. Domesticity, I'm sorry. Domesticity. I don't even want to say those words. Keep moving. Hephaestus, god of forge, fire, metal, sculpture. Persephone, goddess of springtime, seasons. Queen of the underworld. Oh, you probably heard of Hades. God of the underworld, underworld, dead, riches beneath the earth. Is that who controls what happens with the dead? No, it's Yahuwah. But that's the culture of the Greek, that the Greek writings are based on. And that is a fact. That's a fact. The culture of Yahuwah versus the Greek pagan culture. Are you into all these G-O-Ds? Because I'm telling you who they're trying to grab you to. They're trying to grab you to that land, to that world, to that life. That's why they're trying to grab you to. But I'm here to tell you, choose who you will serve. And if it seems evil in your eyes to serve Yahuwah, then choose for yourselves this day who you are going to serve. Whether it be the mighty ones which your fathers served, that were beyond the river. That's what most people are into, ancestry worship. That's what Yahusha, Joshua was saying here, ancestry worship. Or is it going to be the mighty ones of the Amarim in whose land that you currently live? He said, so where you live at now, the government you're under now, the teachers you've been under, the religion you've been, been under now, choose whether it be the mighty ones, the G-O-Ds of your ancestors, or choose where it is where you live now. He goes, but as for me and my house, we serve Yahuwah. That's what my house does. We serve Yahuwah. I don't care about all these other traditions. I don't care what pastor said, what the pastor said, or what the scholars say. I don't care. 
if they can't back it up with common sense, truth from scripture, as backed up by science and history, science and history is pointing to the same thing. And isn't it unique that Yahusha, sign named Joshua, wrote this and that our Savior took on this exact same name, Yahusha. And he had to take that name on because it means Yahuwah is salvation. He couldn't take on his real name of Yahuwah, the Messiah, the Mashiach, because they would have killed him right away then. He would have never even made it unless Yahuwah stopped it. But he came here on a purpose, but he took on the name of Yahusha. Now, Yahusha came after Masha, and he had that warrior spirit. And so you got to decide, are you going to have that warrior spirit that stands for the truth? Yahushua's challenging you, Joshua, is you got to choose who you're going to serve. You're going to serve your traditions. And I'm talking about all of you that has even called on the name of Yahuwah, but still has yet to accept who he really is. Yahushua is Yahuwah. Choose who you're going to serve. Yeah, you got to choose. That's why we came up with the True Scripture Project it was mandatory of us. It's not something that we were like, oh, we really, 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 really had the desire to do. We would, just like all of you, we would love to be able to just grab something and be able to depend on it, a scripture. And we were ordering from all over the place, right? So we went and grabbed the scripture. Oh, yeah, give us a scripture. And as we were reading it, even the ones that started taking out the pagan names, even in all the current English translations, nearly all current English translations of scriptures is riddled with errors and distortions leading you away from the truth. Most all translations that have removed the pagan names still are influenced by Judaism, which is Pharisee, Talmud, translation methods. That means vowel points, spellings, and pronunciation. Almost everyone we've looked at. As a matter of fact, I haven't seen one out there. And I got respect. Listen, I got respect, love, and honor for those who at least advanced it. Because people got to start from somewhere. So I got a ton of respect for all those English translations that have removed, at least got those pagan names out of it. The issue is there's still a lot. I've seen it. I've studied it. And that's what led us to this point. There's so much Judaism that has been, I guess, taken on because people are doing the best they can do. So I applaud that. But that doesn't mean that I have to stop or we have to stop or you have to stop and go, okay, we accept that. If there's a way to create a more pure translation that is exact to what Yahuwah wants, should we do that? And that was said, and that was asked of me in my spirit. And I had to say, well, yes. Is it a ton of work? Yes. Is it expensive? Yes. Does it take extreme discipline and dedication? Yes. But see, the True Scriptures Project is an initiative, and it's born from an urgent need for what? Greater transparency. Like, where did this come from? Here's how it came. How'd you get here? Here it is. And fidelity to the original and or the earliest available scriptures in a world where countless translations have introduced distortions and complications. Our mission is crystal clear with this true scripture project to unearth the unaltered truth embedded in the ancient text. Nearly all of the current English scripture translations are tainted and we are here to rectify that with the true scriptures. Do you want to support that? Because that wording, that mission is on point. Our goal is ambitious. It's a big goal. Big goal. Yet it's straightforward to provide an uncompromising translation of the scriptures. We aim to uncover the divine set apart messages in their purest form faithfully aligned with their original intent and conveyed in a manner that is both straightforward and accessible to everyone. Everyone should have the ability to get to these. And it shouldn't cost everybody a gazillion dollars. We went out and started buying scriptures. It's so crazy. Just to like if you try to go get a Codex Sinatic, it's a facsimile of that now. It's a thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. 
It's crazy. If you go try to go get your hands, and we've talked to the people who actually have the remaining Dead Sea Scrolls. It's hundreds of millions of dollars to get to that. But if we got translation, enough evidence of translation, if we got enough evidence of scripture, I should say, that gives us the ability to get it translated into English in an efficient and a cost-effective way, we need to do it. So what we're doing now, and this is the challenge for you. This is a challenge for you. Because I want to extend you the invitation to join us in this extraordinary voyage of discovery and revelation. So here's what we need. We need your prayers. We need you to stay up to updated as we release information so you can comment on, so you can really give good feedback. And we really need your financial support if you're inspired to do so. All these play a crucial role. With correct information of Yahuwah's intended message, this is a fact. More souls are going to be drawn and saved into his kingdom. That's a fact. To get the message right. By committing your support to this project, you become a part of the community dedicated to promoting the unaltered, unadulterated true scriptures. The realization of this monumental project is a shared endeavor. See, this is a us thing. It's us, you and I and us and we all together. That's what makes up promote the truth. You see, here's what we're inviting you to do. We want you to contribute financially at least something to help the true scripture project come to fruition faster. Your contributions are instrumental in sustaining and advancing this project, ensuring that esteemed truths resonate across the globe. Support this transformative journey. If you go to truescriptures.com, you can go right there, read a little bit about what we're doing on top of this. At the bottom, you will see a contribution form. I want to challenge everyone listening to me to literally help the project. There's so much we can do, but it takes the financial support. It takes the prayers. It takes the, 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 the activity of people pulling together and, and standing for something. Pull together with us on this. This is important because what we've already done is we've got the true scriptures where we started in Barashit. So we started at the beginning. Now, this is important what I'm going to say here. And we've been making some of these, these chapters available as free downloads. You can go over and click the link on the True Scripture Project on PromoteTheTruth.com, and you can get some of these. We haven't put out a ton, but we, we put out enough to make you go, man, this is incredible when I can get a true translation. This makes way more sense to me. The, the words come true. This is an example where we put out the real Exodus, the real Shamut 20. That's important because that's the 10 commandments, right? So we put that out. You can get a free download of that. All right. We put out things like the real Leviticus, Uriqua, chapter 23. You can go get the whole chapter over there underneath the true scriptures project. You can get the whole chapter for free. And why we do that? Because it breaks down Yahuwah's appointed times. And so we were progressing through the Old Testament. We got all of Brent, uh, we've all got Barashit done. So Barashit's done. Shamut is done in the true scriptures. And we were almost done with Uriqua when this big cry came out for the truth when it comes to the Brit Hadash. So we got a major announcement. Major announcement, and why we really need your support. Y'all never heard me really come at you and go, look, if you can do something, do something. And the time is now to do something. And the more you can do, the better. And it's the kingdom. So contribute based upon your desire to see Yahuwah and his word be put out in its most purest form. That's how you should contribute, because we're going to turn it up when it comes to getting his word out there. So a major announcement, major, major announcement is this. We just put out the real John, Yahuhanan, chapter 18. It's a free download over on promotethetruth.com underneath the True Scriptures Project. 
Now, the major announcement is this. The Brita Dash, the New Testament, this is where the spiritual battleground is, where the real spiritual battleground is. This is where the real one is. So what we decided to do is pause the Tanakh translation and then quickly move as fast as possible through the Brit Hadash translation from the true scriptures as taken from the Aramaic and the Hebrew writings, the right ones, the correct ones without all the errors. And I showed you how important that is earlier. Very important. So we're moving and shifting and, 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 and people are crying out and it's urgent. And there's things we can do from a media standpoint, a multimedia standpoint, from a content standpoint to get the word. So as the, as the translation is happening, there's a lot of resources that has to go into the updating and the promotion and spreading the word, which we have an incredible production team, but it's expensive to do this kind of project. It will require us to have to put down some of our traditional business work and take on this work. So we really need the support. So the number one reason why we need to move up to handling the Brit Hadash first is Yahusha is asking, who am I? See, he told them when they were arguing with him, the parashim, the Pharisees, he says, y'all don't understand. These scriptures that y'all talking about, they write about me. That's what Yahushua was saying. They're writing about me. All the prophets were writing about me. Who are all the prophets writing about? Yahuwah. So when he says writing about me, that's why he said before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham came to exist, I am. He said, I, I, again, it's critical that we understand this that you've got to get the right translation and believe the right translation because Yahusha said, he said it in the scriptures. He said, I said to you that you shall die in your sins. For unless you believe, for unless you believe that Aya Asha Aya, I am that I am, the a living Alua, you shall die in your sins. And we are watching people that are coming to Yahuwah and they're getting so caught up on the Greek way of thinking and they're trying to separate Yahusha and Yahuwah and they are one. And Yahusha is Yahuwah. Yahuwah is Yahusha and they have roles, but they're one. But if you don't believe that Yahusha is Yahuwah, look at that scripture that's properly translated. Unless you believe that Yahusha is Aya Asha Aya, do you believe that? Do you believe that he's saying exactly what Yahuwah said on Mount Shini in Shamu chapter three? Do you believe that he said that? Because if you don't, you will not see eternal life based upon the real scriptures. So that's why we got to get this word out here to the world. Number two reason, all Greek translated New Testament seek to delete the Tanakh. That is a fact. They want to get rid of the Old Testament. You've heard it over and over and over and over and over again. They want to tell you that the Old Testament is done away with. That's what they want to say. And so with the correct translation, they can't say it. I'm telling you, if that's promoted and we've got great media and marketing behind it and we got great input and we got great activity from the community to spread this everywhere, we will begin to tear down these strongholds and bridge it all together. This is why this is important and your contributions are important. Now, what is all scripture? If they're seeking to delete and negate the, the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, in 2 Timothy, we call him Timothy, 3, 16 and 17, it says, all scripture is breathed out of the mouth of Allah and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man or one man of Allah may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Anyone that teaches the Tanakh Old Testament is done away with is anti-Yahuwah, anti-Mashiach. They're the anti-Messiah. 
if they're teaching that the Tanakh is done away with because the Tanakh wrote about the Savior and Yahuwah said, I am the only Savior. And then he came as Yahusha to be the Savior and he fulfilled it. And Yahusha kept telling everybody, anybody that has seen me has seen the Father. And when he returns, go look at Hazum, Revelation 14. It says that the Father's name will be in their foreheads. Didn't say Yahusha's name will be in the foreheads. It says that Yahuwah's name will be in the foreheads. Yahusha is no longer here. He accomplished the mission, that human part of him. On earth, he returned to his rightful place as Yahuwah. And we've got to understand that. So people say, what are you saying? There's not a son, you know, there's not a spirit, there's not a father. Yes, but they're one. Are you talking about a trinity? No, I'm talking about the word. We don't care about a trinity. We don't care about a, 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 a whatever you want to call it, a double, a quadruple. We don't care. Only thing we care about is the scripture. Yahuwah said he is one. Yahusha said anybody has seen him has seen the father. And the word became flesh. The word was with the lure and the word was a lure. We believe him. So anybody that's out there trying to separate the son and the father and tries to teach that Yahusha is not Yahuwah, they're anti-Mashiach. Anybody that tries to negate the Tanakh, they're anti-Yahuwah and anti-Mashiach. They're anti. So how do we come and bring this to the world? The true scripture is going to settle a lot of this. So we're asking for your support. Support the mission. We urge you to embrace the set-apart wisdom we've shared with you here. Let us unite together in our quest for truth, prioritizing, prioritizing Yahuwah above all. Let's put Yahuwah first. Let's choose to serve him first and bear witness to the transformative power and blessings emanating from the revelations of the True Scriptures Project. See, what I've shared with you, hardly anybody's teaching. Y'all know that. So go to truescriptures.com. Just go in your heart. Hang, hang tight. I want to talk to you face to face. That's why I took it off the screen. I've shared with you what we're asking you to do, which is support the project. We've asked for your prayers. We ask you to stay engaged, right? Join our Telegram group so we can give you good discipleship every single day. Like we're pouring in. If you go to pttgram.com, you can get that discipleship. But right now, there's a call. There's a battle call for the truth. We have moved up the Brit Hadash in the project of the Truth Scriptures Project. The New Testament, we got to move it up. We've been, we've been listening to the feedback. We've been studying and watching the environment. And we're going, oh, we get it. People don't really get who Yahushua is. You see, and then we got people that are calling on the name of Yahuwah and then they're missing who Yahushua is being Yahuwah. Then we're going to have division like crazy. We don't have to have it. The only reason there's division, misunderstanding is the translations because people keep quoting wrong translations coming from the Greek when they don't understand who Yahushua is, when they think that the Tanakh is done away with. They are quoting the wrong text. When they're saying things that when Yahuwah said he doesn't change, and then you see something in the in the Brit Hadash, the New Testament, that is saying it's changed it, you know that's a wrong translation. And I guarantee you, that's Greek. But what you will see with the True Scriptures Project, that we will back up. You'll see it. If you go over and just download the free download that we gave you at the True Scriptures Project, go to promote the truth.com and download it. And what we did with that particular Yahuhan in chapter 18, we put the Aramaic and then we've got the Abari text underneath the English text. And, and so what we're going to do when we come out with the true scriptures is we'll put it out pr probably in all the English. And then we'll do another version where it takes way more time to put those translations available at the same time. So people will be able to, to progress with the project. But our goal is to get this into your hands as fast as possible. So you will have the entire scriptures. And then you will have also where people got in their hands right away, the Brihadash. Now, why is that important? Because nobody's really arguing about the Tanakh. You see, they don't go argue when they're dealing with just the Abari. Notice that. 
The argument is when we bring Greek and Latin into the equation. Now we have arguments. Now we have deceptions and distortions. So listen, I want you to contribute. And I'm being raw here because I know what we need to do. And I know what we can do. And I know we can't do it all as fast as we want to do on our own. We just don't have the resources to do that here. So Yahuwah in my spirit is saying, go talk to those and those that hear my voice, they will come forward and contribute. When you contribute, when you go to truthscriptures.com and you hit that contribute button and you do the best you can and people ask us, is that a tax write-off? No, we don't want to be manipulated or influenced by governmental entities. So when you give it, you gave it. Now, if you can figure out tax ways to do that, that's up to you. But we're saying when you gave it, you gave it to the kingdom. We're going to take it and we're going to put it to use in the kingdom. We're going to go to work like we're always doing, but we need to free up more of our staff's time because we build the kingdom just like Yahushua and the family were doing early on, right? They were carpenters. They were doing work. And then all of a sudden you saw them go, look, we got to just go handle kingdom business. So what we're saying now is, look, we need to primarily get focused on kingdom business. So with the businesses and work that we do, let's take time out of that. Let's bring staff. I got a, I got a lot of staff. They call on Yahuwah. That's like un almost unheard of. Guess what? They don't have to ask us for the Shabbat's off. They don't have to ask us for the set apart days, the appointed times, the festivals. We practice it and we do our company based upon it. That's our traditional business. But now we know that Yahoo is calling us with this project to go. And we want to get the multimedia out there. We want to get into the millions of views on our channels. So people know this. And we want you to support. So if you can reach and dig deep and go, okay, I'm going to financially support and put this in faith, I promise you. You won't be disappointed. I promise you, you're going to, in eternity, I promise you, in eternity, you will know that you did a great thing with this project. You were a part of bringing the revolution of the truth back, which I believe is going to bring Yahuwah back here in the right manner. He said, unless this word is preached throughout the, four, the entire world, four quarters of the world, guess what? The end won't come. We want to expedite that. And your contribution for a fact can help do that. So go over to truthscriptures.com, make your contribution. We're going to be doing something special for those that contribute $1,000 or more. We're working on that right now to put them in priority. It's just the way it is. The contributions really make a difference. So we're talking about doing something special. For those of you that can do $1,000 or more in contribution, I promise you, you're going to get something special. You, more than likely, you'll get the releases first. I'm not saying everybody doesn't matter. Everybody counts. But if you can pull together and, and, and get over a thousand, some people can do it at one time and some people can build up to it, right? So whoever, it comes because it has a record when you go over to truescriptures.com and it records you, make sure you're using the same email and name, it's recording when you're giving. And we when we see that a person is given, given over a thousand or more, we want to be able to bless them to be able to get some, some, some priority access. Everybody is important, but we know that the contributions make a difference. And that's why we're upfront about it here at Promote the Truth. It costs money to make these things happen. People say, why don't y'all do this for free? Because you ain't got nothing for free. There's no Bible you got for free out there unless somebody gave it to you and that costs somebody. So we're going to teach people the right way how to do kingdom business, kingdom work. And we want to get people through this project, we want to not only have the true scriptures project, we want to have the, the, the scriptures way of life, which means we want to teach people to become entrepreneurs. We want to teach people to do more homeschooling so they're not dependent upon the system. There's way more to this than, than you could ever imagine. So your contributions make a difference. Go to truthscriptures.com, make that contribution. And I tell you what, Yahuwah, the heavens are going to be very, very proud that you stepped up. I feel that in my spirit. Thank you for listening. Hopefully this has helped you go to another level. I believe it has. And I can't wait to see you with us promoting the truth more. Let's keep promoting the truth. <laughs>